In this video, we're gonna set up the logic for this page. So all we've got is the UI set up right here, but none of the buttons actually work. So we're gonna bind our actions, our logic to these buttons so that the user can sign up and log in. Now, in the previous videos, we already set up Firebase right here and authentication. So our backend services are prepared for the logic that we're gonna define now. All right, so what do we want to happen? Well, we have two tabs right here, a login tab and a sign up tab. And so let's start up with the sign up tab. So when the user puts in their email and their password and a confirmation password and presses this button, we want them to be able to sign in. We want to create a user account for them. Okay, so where do we start with this logic? Well. We want this to trigger when the user clicks on the button, so let's select the button. And in Flutterflow, all of our logic is defined in the second tab here where we have our action flow editor. So here you'll add actions, blocks of logic that you want executed. And here you can add it by clicking this button, or if you wanna check for some condition first and then execute some action based on whether that condition is true or false, you could click on this. But let's add an action. Now, I find that it's easier to define our action inside this action flow editor. So let's open that up. And this is the same thing as what we just saw, but we have more space. Now, the first thing to look at is our triggers up here. That is, what will be the event that initiates this action flow, whether we have one action or multiple actions. So right now we have on tap. So when the user taps this button, then all of this logic will execute. If we go over here, there's no actions defined yet. So let's go back to over to our on tap and here's our first action block. So let's select it here and you can see that we have all the different action blocks that we have available to us. What we wanna do is we wanna do something with authentication. So I know that it's in this backend and database right here and we've got a whole section devoted to Firebase authentication. So when we twirl this open, we see a bunch of different action blocks we have available. And what we wanna do is we wanna create a user account. Now, after we select the action block, then over here we'll be given the options that are particular to that action block. If you wanna change that action block, of course you can come in here and select a different one, but this is the one that we want. So let's just walk through these options. So the first one is the auth provider. That is, what kind of authentication is this? Well, back when we set up our authentication, we only set up email at this point. So that's the only one that we can do right here. And then we have these next three options where we have to pass this data, send this data to Firebase authentication. So we need to send an email address, a password, and then a confirmation password. So let's set our email field, and you can see this is pre-populated with a bunch of stuff right here. But where are these coming from? Well, Flutterflow automatically recognizes text fields. Those are those text inputs right here on the page. And we have three here and two in this tab, so that's why we're seeing five in our action flow editor right here. And these names are coming from the names of the widgets. So if you see down here, that's this first one up here, and this name is coming from there. Okay, so then we can just bind it to our sign up email widget. Beautiful. Next, we've got a password field. And when we twirl this open, we can't even twirl it open because there's no available password field. Well, why is this happening? Well, this is because we haven't actually set up this text field to be a password. Text fields are very robust widgets because they're the fundamental way that you're gonna pass information into your app and into your backend. So it needs to have a bunch of features for security and accessibility and usability. So let's take a look at some of these now. Now, these first options are up here are gonna have to do with styling. And when you scroll down to the end here, you're going to see some of these options. And the first one is the password field. So let's click this on. And after we turn this on, we can see that now that error has gone away and we have one field available to us. So we can just select that now, but let's look at a few other options on this text field widget. When we click this on, this new option appeared, toggle hide password icon. And so let's just give it a size of here of say 24 pixels and you can see that we get this hide password icon. So by default, their password will be hidden. So it'll use those dots instead of the actual password to ensure security. So people can't see it when they're typing in. You can set the icon color. We'll just leave it at the default. And that's all we need for this password field. Now, the one other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set this submit type. Now, 
What this will do is it'll set the text of the button on the keyboard. So the keyboard that pops up, what should the big button at the bottom right say? And what action should that trigger? Well, we want it to trigger to go to the next field. Okay, great, that's all we need here. Next, let's set our confirmation password configuration. So we want this to be a password field as well. We can set the same toggle size and we'll set the submit type to done so it'll dismiss the keyboard so they can press the button. The last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna turn off autofocus right here. Whichever text field has autofocus, that's where the cursor will end up with the keyboard popping up when the page loads. We're not gonna set this on anything because the user has an option whether to sign in or log in. And if they're trying to log in, but it auto focuses to email, then they'll have to ha click away to close the keyboard and then click login. Next, we're gonna show clear field icon. That's just an X that allows them if they make a mistake to clear it quickly. It's helpful for accessibility and user experience. Next, let's scroll down to our keyboard type. And this is very helpful to set because it'll determine what will appear on the keyboard. So here here will be an email address, so we'll add that as the keyboard type. And we'll set the submit type to next. Beautiful. Next, let's go over to login and we'll set the fields here. First, let's just fix this text right here because that should be email address. So let's go down here and say email. And then we can scroll down here. We don't want our autofocus. And this will be an email address. We also want that clear field icon. So let's set that and accept the default color and set our submit type to next. And come down to our password, turn off autofocus, turn on password field, give it an icon size, and select our submit type to done. All right, our text fields are set up, so let's go back into our authentication logic and complete that. So we can come into our button right here. Let's go back to this tab, select our button, and come into our confirm password field, and we've got this confirm password. Beautiful. We're almost done. Here we've got a toggle about whether we want to create a user document. Now, what what this is saying is that we have set up a collection of users here and this is just a normal collection and normally you want to have a user document so this is just a helpful way to create one inside of this action so you don't have to have an additional action we just select which collection it is it's our users collection and then we need to set the fields what are the fields well the fields are each one of these individual things here so we can set our email and let's open this up this this is the email field that's already selected. If you want a specific value, so you would hard code it in here, but we want it dynamic. We want it coming from this field here. So we want it from a variable. And so when we click in here, we can see all of the data sources we have available to us. Now there's a shortcut here where you can just click on the canvas right here and it'll bind it. But so you know where it comes from, let's go edit this binding right here. And it's coming from this widget state because it's coming from the widget itself. And because we've got these named helpfully, we know that it's coming from our sign up email. So those are two ways to do the same thing. And finally, we always want to set our default variable value. This is to avoid any null errors. And we can just put example at email.com and confirm. Let's set one more field and that's the created time. So let's go to that and we can bind this from the global property of the current time and confirm. Now we're not collecting any of the other fields, so we're all done. Lastly, we've got this option about whether we want to automatically navigate the users. If this is on, this will navigate the user to the page you have specified right here, the logged in page, because after we create the account, they will be logged logged in and so they can be forwarded here. Now we actually don't want to navigate them automatically because in our designs we have an onboarding page where we're going to collect their birthday and profile image. So we're going to handle navigation manually so we can just click this off. So let's just create that page right now. So we'll create a blank page. We'll call it onboarding and go back to our login page to this button. And now we wanna navigate the users to that page. Well, how do we do that? Well, we don't wanna do it in this view right here because we can only apply and configure logic that has one block. So let's open up our action flow editor here and we just wanna add this plus right here or gonna add an additional action. Next, we wanna navigate the user. So let's search this time, navigate, and we wanna navigate to this onboarding page. Now, the only option that we wanna change right here is allow back navigation. So that's when a user swipes their finger from the left to the right. And we want to disallow 
allow that action because they've already been logged in. So we're gonna turn that off and everything else will keep at the default. Beautiful, so let's close this and we're almost ready to test. But let's just finish out the logic for this page. So we've got this other tab of our login right here. We've already configured our text fields. So we can just go straight to our button, except for that won't work. And that's of course, because we've already defined our logic on this button. And this will often happen. Sometimes you won't discover what your UI needs until you start building out the logic. And there's nothing wrong with this. So how do we solve this? Well, the easiest way to solve this is to add another button. So we have one button for signing up and one for logging in and then show and hide them based on what tab is selected. So we can come into this button right here and let's change the text in here and change it to sign up. And then let's wrap this inside a stack so that these two buttons will be stacked on top of one another. So we'll use one of our three most important keyboard shortcuts, Command or Control B to wrap a widget and we'll wrap it in a stack. Then we'll just grab our button again. We'll Command D duplicate it and we'll change this one to log in. And let's change the name of them so we know what these are in the widget tree and our other button, this will be sign up button, great. Now, remember the little aphorism in stacks, the top is the bottom. So the top of the stack that you see right here will be the bottom widget. If we just hide this for a second here, we can see our login. So we're hiding the bottom one, which is the top one, so we can see this one here. Okay, so how do we conditionally show and hide these? Well, we're already in here in visibility and we're on our sign up button right here. So let's click on our conditional visibility widget and come in here. And so what do we do? Well, what we wanna do is that this expression, that is what's in here, is expecting a Boolean. Whatever this evaluates to, if it's true, then this will be shown. And if it's false, it will be hidden. So what do we wanna check for? Well, we wanna check for something about this tab bar. That is, if the user is on the right tab. And if we wanna check for something in the tab bar, then we wanna look to widget state. So if we twirl this open, we can see that the first option is what we want, the tab bar current index. That is, it gives us an index, a number that Flutterflow will automatically update when the user clicks between between the different tabs. So that's what we want, let's grab that. Now Flutterflow did a nice thing for us right here because we actually did something wrong. This is expecting a Boolean, a true or false value, but we selected an integer, a number. So what it did is it pop that inside a conditional. This would be the same as if we did something like this, come into a condition, single condition, and then set this value to our widget state of our tab bar. This is just a really helpful utility function and these are all over the place. Okay, so we wanna check if the first value, our tab bar index is equal to what? Well, we're on the sign up button right here and these tab bars are zero indexed. So this first one over here isn't one, but it's zero. Okay, so we wanna check if it's equal to zero. So if it's equal to zero, then this expression right here, that is tab bar current in index equal to zero, will evaluate, will be true, and so it'll be shown. Now, if you see these two equals here and might and think that it's a typo, it's not a typo. In most programming languages, if you have one equals, that is assignment. That is, you're assigning the value of whatever is on the left hand hand right here to whatever is on the right hand over here. If you want to check for a condition like equality here, then you use two equal signs. Okay, so this is great. Let's confirm this. Then let's set up the same logic on our second button. But instead of just doing all that work again, we can come in here and just grab this value. Let's copy this value, then come over to our login button, come into our conditional visibility in here. And then you see we've got this little paste button button and we paste it in. Then we just have to change this value to one because the login is an index of one and confirm, beautiful. And because we have conditional visibility set, we have these little icons right here. Okay, so we're almost ready to test it, but we have to add the logic to our login button. Now you can see here, we already have two actions bound here, and that's just because we duplicated the button. So let's come in here, we're in our login button, let's open this up and let's delete this second action here. And we can come in here and we can redefine this action block. We want to log the user in. So let's come into backend database, Firebase authentication, 
and log in. Here, the email provider is set correctly, but we don't wanna sign up the email, we want the login email. Remember, these are the widgets where this data is coming from, and then login password. Finally, we've got the navigate automatically, and we can do that here, because if the user is logging in, they've probably already completed that onboarding and just wanna to go to the main tasks page. Beautiful, so this is all set up and we're ready to test it. So let's come up here to test and it'll pop open a new window. This will take two to three minutes to spin up the first time, but then it'll hot reload instantly whenever we make a change. All right, so first let's test our conditional visibility. So we see our sign up button, that looks good. So let's click over to our login and we can see that now we've got our login button. Beautiful, that works. So let's sign up a user and sign up. Beautiful, it looks like it worked, but let's go over and check our user's collection to see if a user document was created. So we can come over to our Firestore here and into Manage Content, and there I am, beautiful. Next, let's test our, our login feature, but we need some way to log our user out. And this is simple, so we can just go to our task screen. Let's just add a button right here and call this Log Out. Then we can just define some logic and let's search for Log Out, and there it is. Then we go back to our test mode, let's instantly reload, then we can log out and come over to login and put it in those same credentials and log in, beautiful. Now, there's one other best practice I wanna show you that we haven't covered yet, and that is form validation. Whenever you're receiving data, there's normally rules that you want applied before you accept the data, and you can check for those with form validation. And these would be things like making sure your password is of sufficient length. And you can do that by wrapping your text fields in a form validation block. And it doesn't have to be the immediate parent. So here I've got three, and I'm gonna go up to my column here and use my trusty command B to wrap these in a form validation block. So now here I'm in my form validation block, and when I scroll down, I've got with properties, and I'm just gonna leave that as is because I'm handling that elsewhere. And then I've got these options under validation, which are the most important ones. Now, these will be populated with any fields that support validation. And if you want them validated, you can just select them here. And when you select them, you'll see what validation options you have available. So you can put in a specific message, minimum, maximum allowed characters, and text validator. So here for my email, I wanna make sure that it's a valid email. For my password and confirmation, I wanna make sure that there are a minimum of seven characters. So I'm gonna add that in. Okay, so we've set up the validation criteria, but then we need to tell Flutterflow when to execute this logic. And because this is logic, it should go where all the rest of the logic goes, in the action flow editor. But we don't want it on this form block because we want it defined on the actual buttons. So let's come over to our sign up button over here, come into our action flow editor. Let's give some more space right here. And when do we wanna run this? Well, we wanna run this before the authentication action occurs because we want to stop the execution flow if it's not valid. But how do we get it up there? Let me show you. So let's add in a validation action. So just search for validation validate form, select which form. We haven't named it yet, so it's just this form one. And then we can use these arrows to move this up. Beautiful. Let's rename this. So let's close this out. Let's come into our form here and let's call this form dash sign up. Beautiful. So when we come back into our action flow editor here, we can see that name. All right, let's try this out. To see these changes, we're gonna instantly reload. Let's put in a new user, but let's put in a password that's insufficiently long. And when we click sign up, we can see that we get this error message and we get our error color. And we also have an overflow error. So where is this color coming from? And let's fix this error. This color is coming from when you're in your text field down here and scroll all the way down you can see we get this error border color. So that's where that's coming from. Let's come up to our container here and give a little bit more room so we have room for that error. And this authentication is done. Lastly, we need to set up validation in our login form, and then this authentication page is done. I'll leave that up to you for a challenge for this video, and we'll see you in the next one.